Okay, good afternoon. Thank you for your patience. It takes a while to check so many people in at the front desk. Uh, my name is Sue Dalton. I am the Corporate Director of Sales for Goodman House and so grateful to see so many faces here this afternoon after so long. Um, and I want a special welcome, a special welcome to our Priority Club guests and also to those of you who are not yet Priority Club members. Um, and I'd like a show of hands of those of you who are visiting Goodwin House Bailey's Crossroads for the very first time. Wow. Wow. Applause for those people who are visiting Bailey's Crossroads for the first time. That is great. I'm so glad that you're here. Um, I, it's my pleasure to introduce to you today our featured speaker for today's event, who I know you will enjoy, Margaret Novak, and that's Margaret rhymes with Target, right? <clears throat> Is an entrepreneur, thought leader, and widely considered founder of the senior move management industry. After decades in the field of aging and senior living, she moved away from her life of work and title, I'm looking forward to that, to another role, that of author, speaker, and champion of a revisioned picture of aging. The title of her book is Squint, Revisioning the Second Half of Life. And we're pleased that we have copies of that book for each and every one of you today, if you're interested. We'll be handing those out at the end of our program today. Margaret is an expert in downsizing and in the emotional obstacles that make downsizing difficult for all of us. With her unique style and memorable stories, which you'll hear today, Margaret will share why success in downsizing doesn't require working hard, but it does require working smart. So please join me in welcoming Margaret Novak. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Okay, I'm pretty loud without a mic. I'm with a mic, probably four buildings over. Um, I, this is my first in-person program since COVID, and I am so excited to be seeing you in person. Now, I know that I can't see your smile or frown because of the mask, but please feel free to nod your head vigorously if you like something. Um, what I'm gonna talk about today uh, are not things you're going to find in a list. There is no shortage of lists about how to downsize. Here's what you do first. Here's what you do second. You can, we can just go online and find lists. The problem is there are emotional obstacles. And, you know, we, this impacts all of us. I, I'm going to do something really fast right now, but it, it's going to illustrate how universal this is. So I'm going to ask you to stand up for just a minute. If you would, stand up. Now, I'm going to say a statement. And if that statement applies to you, I want you to sit down. Otherwise, remain standing. So if you still have college textbooks or papers, I want you to sit down. Whoa! We lost a lot on that one. You never know when you need French one textbooks again. All right. If you have televisions that do not work or that you no longer use, but they are still in your house, sit down. If you have shelves and shelves of cookbooks, but the last five times you wanted a recipe, you found it online, sit down. If you have enough material to fill a Joann's fabric store or enough lumber to fill a Home Depot lumber area, I want you to sit down. Now this last question is a trick question because if it applies to you, I don't want you to sit down. I want you to remain standing. So I want you to remain standing if everything in your closet fits. <laughs> Congratulations to the people still standing. But you know, whatever it is, 
we just, you can sit down now, okay? <laughs> we all have things and it is those emotional roadblocks. So I have created an acronym that helps me remember what those five roadblocks are. And that's why I talked about the importance of working smart because the acronym is S-M-A-R-T, SMART. And the S stands for strategic. And what do I mean by strategic? As a move manager, I was asked by clients all the time, what do you think I can do? How much can I get for my mother's china? What can I get for this piece of art? What about this dining, beautiful dining room set? And the irony is most of us will not be able to get much revenue at all from things that are in our house. And yet the most expensive thing we own, which people don't seem to pay a lot of attention to, is our house itself. For most of us, our biggest single asset is the home we live in. And if you've lived, how many people have lived in their house for 10 years or more? Almost everyone, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, anyone 50 years? How many years, ma'am? 55, 50, 50. Well, you know, whether it's 40 or 50 or 30, we all have acquired a lot and our homes have really appreciated, especially in this day and age. That's where the real opportunity to make money is. So the, the, the point of being strategic is to put your energy not into those dishes or that china closet, which probably can't be sold at all, or dining room tables, but the house. And one of the challenging parts, if you've talked to a realtor, is that the realtor is probably giving you advice of how to appeal to today's buyer. Now, how old do you think to, you're the buyer of your house is likely to be? Anyone? 30s, 40s. Okay. This is a generation that grew up on home goods, Ikea, West Elm. None of us have our home filled with that furniture, but that's the look they like. And your realtor is giving you advice of what appeals to them. But when she says, or he says, get rid of the oriental carpets, today's buyer wants to see the hardwood floor, take down all of your curtains, no pictures with faces, take out part of this furniture. Often this, advice doesn't feel right. It feels like, well, that's not going to make it more appealing. It's going to seem barren. It's okay. Is that a five minute warning? I thought I had more time. Okay. So it's often that advice, it, you know, we talk to the realtor, but it doesn't make us happy to do it. But here's the thing. Did anyone here ever sell a car? When you sold your car, when you decided to sell your car, what was the first thing you did? It Cleaned right. it, inside or out? Both. If you had something hanging from the rear view mirror, like an air freshener, what did you do with it? Took it out. If you used a pillow for your back, what did you do with it? Out. You took out everything personal in your car because you knew that the person coming to look at your car wasn't interested in how you used it. They just wanted to look at the car. You were being strategic and it didn't feel emotional. You said to yourself, well, that's how you get the most money when you wanna sell your car. But a home feels different from a car. Yet the same guidelines do apply. It's, it's making the house impersonal it's setting the table for your company, for your buyer. So let's talk about setting the table. Let's say you invited someone to dinner and they were a gluten intolerant vegan. Now, I know you might say you would not invite over 
a gluten intolerant vegan. But actually, my husband and I are having company this weekend, so he always sends out an email saying, well, are there any food things I should know about? They both are vegans. And this one doesn't eat tarragon, thyme, or cilantro. And this one doesn't like onion. I said to Bill, can we uninvite them? Like, how, I don't even know what to make. But anyway, so let's say you invited them to dinner. Would you make beef wellington or rice mushroom lasagna? You would make the lasagna not because it's what appeals to you. It's because you have advanced information about what's going to appeal to your house guests. And as, as a host or hostess, that always seemed natural to you. You would create what you knew would appeal to the people coming to your home. So I'm going to ask you, when you look at selling your home, to remember selling your car, to think about inviting someone to dinner and knowing in advance what they're likely to like. These things didn't feel emotional. It was just being strategic. And I'm encouraging you to be strategic with the biggest asset you own, your home. Because this is where an opportunity to make tens and twenties and $50,000 more ranges. This, this is where that opportunity lies. The difference between having a home that is properly prepared to appeal to the likely buyer and one where an owner has said, I'm not making those changes. Let's be smart and be strategic. So that's the S in smart. Now the M in smart is about managing our emotions. And by this, I mean managing our expectations if we give something away. I had a client who had a burl mahogany high boy. It was a beautiful, rich burl, but it was tall. And she decided it wasn't the right scale for her new apartment. So she asked her kids if anyone wanted it. And she was delighted when her daughter said, yes, that will be a great bureau for her granddaughter, Megan. So she said, great. She ships it to her daughter. And a few months later, she goes to visit and she goes upstairs to Megan's bedroom. And there is her high boy painted blue. <laughs> and her first reaction was, how could you have done? And then she said, I had to zip it. I had given it away. You know, all of us probably inherited things from our parents, aunts, uncles, grandparents, and when we accepted those things, we accepted obligations that went with them on what to do with it. How many people here feel that if their children agree to accept something, or their grandchildren, that they will accept obligations? We're the last generation that accepted gifts with strings. Our kids are not going to doubt. They will give it away, donate it, paint it whatever. And it's really easy to have something you were happy that gave you joy to gift it suddenly become the cause of an argument or resentment that you have to your family with your family member over a thing when that was the last thing you wanted. But it's really easy to gift the thing but keep a hold of the emotional attachment. My Aunt Betty had been married three times. She had a lot of rings. She did. So she said to me, Margaret, I hope you don't take this the wrong way, but I'm not going to be leaving the rings to you. I'm going to leave them to Miriam, who was my niece, who is my niece, who was then like four. And I said, that's fine. She said, I'll explain why. You have sons. And I'm concerned that when the sons grow up, they're going to meet a girl and want to get married and you're going to give them one of my diamond rings to use as the engagement ring and then they're going to get married, but then they're going to get divorced and the ring will leave the family. I said, okay. So 25 years since that conversation passed, Miriam, who was little, is now 33 and she's pregnant. 
And I would not have the nerve, just the heart to say to Betty, you know, they've done amnio. It's going to be a little boy. <laughs> and when he grows up, he might meet a girl or a boy and want to get married. And Miriam might give him the ring. And they might get married, but then they might get divorced, and then the ring could leave the family. I mean, how long can you control what happens to something? The answer is you can't, but boy, we try. So that's about managing expectations and not having things become sources of resentment when that is the last thing we want with our family members. But you can manage, people often say to me, what do I do when my spouse doesn't feel the same way I do about something? How do I manage, traverse this relationship? Well, when we moved, my husband and I had different ways of handling that. He would call me up and say, hi, you won't miss what I got rid of today. <laughs> and I would say, what did you get rid of today? And he would say, I'm not telling you, you won't miss it. And I never missed a thing. So I don't know if he really got rid of things and it's true, we wouldn't even miss them or if he was simply doing this to torture me, which is also possible. What's that? Shouldn't have told me. So one day, one day we were thinking about, we're getting ready to move, and he, said, he takes out a, a big circulating fan that we had used, and he said, you know, we lived on a street that you could put out a sign saying for free. So we said, I'm putting the sign out, the fan out with the sign saying for free. I said, Bill, you can't do that. The fan doesn't work. He said, well, I'm not very mechanical, but maybe someone can get it working because it was really a strong fan. So he puts it out with a sign saying for free. And five minutes later, we hear a car door slam. And Bill looks out. The fan is gone. And he says, see? And 10 minutes later, we hear a car door slam, <laughs> and the fan is back. And I said, see, I will tell you a sense of humor as you are doing this goes a long way. So the M in SMART is managing emotions that we have when we, and expectations that we have when we give things away and letting go of those expectations because relationships are too important to have to let things interfere with them. So now we come to the A in SMART. Now I know just as a mother shouldn't have a favorite child, a speaker shouldn't have a favorite letter but I have to tell you, I really love the A. The A stands for abundance. And this represents all of the things that we have in a huge quantity because we rationalize why we need so many. Now, I'm going to show you some of what I have in a large quantity, and this may be different from what you have, but I have been in thousands of homes. We all have things. So this is how rationalization works. You see these two measuring cups? They look ordinary, but they are not ordinary because one of them is two thirds and one of them is three quarters. And when I saw this set, I said, how cool is that? I'm going to get this measuring, these measuring cups because when I am baking, instead of using one third twice, I can use two thirds once and save 1.4 nanoseconds while I'm baking. So that's why I rationalize getting them. And they are fine, but I use the one half for oatmeal and the one cup for dog food. So now I needed another set of measuring cups. So next, I got this one. 
Now, I don't know if you can see that it gets narrower at the bottom. And I knew, and it has a spout, very good for pouring. And I knew that each of these widths represents a quantity. And I kind of like this design. So I said, I'm going to get, I need another measuring cup. I'm going to get this one. And it is a clever design. I have found that even with a flashlight and magnif magnifying glass, I can't really see where the, where the quantity is. So it didn't fulfill my hopes, but I still thought it was a nice design. So then I went to Bed Bath & Beyond with my 20% off coupon, and I went to the OXO section. Anyone here have OXO products? They are really well designed. So I'm going to give you a little um, non sequitur. Do you know how OXO got started? I believe it was um, the person who had wherever, um, one, one of the major uh, pots and pan types of, of manufacturers. And his wife had really bad arthritis. And she had difficulty using many of the everyday utensils. So he got together gerontologists and occupational therapists and manufacturing design people. And he said, there must be a more inclusive way of designing everyday kitchen utensils. And that was the birth of OXO. And the kitchen, the pots and pans and utensil field was a really well-developed field where breaking in a new product would be challenging. And OXO wasn't just a new product, it is priced higher than many of the other products, and it quickly gathered like a 25% market share because people just saw this is better. It's better made. It's Whatever is easier to use for somebody if they have a challenge is easier to use for, for everyone. So that's the story of OXO. These are OXO cups, and they do have two thirds, and it does have three quarters. It comes, they snap together. It came with a hook so I could hang it up. It came with a spatula so I could even out the contents. This set of measuring cups did so many things that it has a user's manual. <laughs> Who wants a user's manual for their measuring cup? Okay, I still wasn't happy, but so I'm at Home Goods. Anyone here shop at Home Goods? You know how when you're ready to check out, they don't, you don't walk, you don't just walk to the checkout area. You meander through some areas that have a lot of really attractive, colorful things you might decide you need before you exit. Well, that's what I was doing, meandering through on the way to the checkout when I saw these. So these are. First of all, after three black sets, aren't these colorful? They're really cheery. I'm not a scoop person, but look what these measuring cups do. They're also teaspoons. They multitask. So I said, oh, I, I need to get these measuring scoops. Without question, I picked them up, put them in my basket. Unfortunately, right next to them, we're measuring Plastic, rubber, look how cute this is, rubber measuring bowls. Now, they're in like milliliters or something. I don't even understand it, but I thought they really looked cute. And does anyone here watch the cooking channel? So do you know how they have everything already pre-measured? So I had visions that I would, be, I would use these not to measure per se, but to have everything pre-made and I would go like this, which is an odd vision because I don't cook. Ever, <laughs> ever, I burn everything. My husband does the cooking, but that's why I got this set. So I had a lot of measuring cups. Um, and I really, now you can see how I rationalized each one. And I said, I have enough measuring cups. Have you ever had a collection that you had decided was big enough so you no longer were adding to it? But people who know you know that you have this collection. So when they come to visit or travel, they bring you more of it. Anyone have a collection like that? 
What is your collection of? Uh, bud, vases. bud vases. If you have too many, this is where to bring them. How about anyone else? What's your collection? Ducks. ducks. Not everyone has a lot of ducks, but this is where they go. Anyone else with an unusual collection? Yes. Turtle ornaments. You know, you can see the things we collect, whether they're turtles, ducks, bud vases, or measuring cups, don't have to be exotic or expensive. We collect all kinds of things. And so it, you can get to a point where you're not going to add any more, but people bring them to you. I want you to meet Isabel. <laughs> Now, I know you didn't know that measuring cups came with sexes, but Isabel is a little girl. She has a cute little butt over here. She's not sold in stores, only online, and she is a one-quarter cup. And she was a gift, and the card said, my name is Isabel, I'm a quarter cup. My brothers are one-third, one cup, and one half. Please don't make me an only child. <laughs> Isabel came with a guilt trip. Now, if you said, you might say to me, okay, you rationalize why you have all of these. Which one do you really use? Well, that's easy. I use the $1 set from the dollar store and a two cup Pyrex. That's what I end up using. So you might say, well, we get it. I get, we get how we all rationalize and end up with lots of certain things and then they become a problem how to get rid of them. Um, what is the antidote? And I think the antidote is something I call smart self-talk. Smart self-talk. Smart self-talk is asking yourself a question that can be answered with yes, with one word. The one word is either yes or no, or a number. So for example, if I were downsizing and said, when I moved to Goodwin House, when I moved to Goodwin House, can I do all of my measuring with this set and a Pyrex? And the answer would be yes. I won't ask myself, which do I like? We've seen how I will answer that question. I will have a reason for liking all of them. And whether it's measuring cups or sink frying pans. Oh, this is macaroni and cheese. Like we have these single pur purpose dishes and this frying pan is for eggs. But And gentlemen, do not think this is only about women or only about kitchens. I have been to basements that have Maxim jars arranged or all kinds of jars with screws sorted and bolts. I mean... You know, Lowe's tool section isn't as well equipped as some basements I've seen. And we, had, we just all have things that we've kept acquiring and acquiring. So smart self-talk is a good tool. Um, I, for example, when I was going through my t-shirt drawer, and I'm not talking about like Chico's t-shirts. I'm talking about work in the garden, go to the gym grunge t-shirts. I'm looking through and I have like 25, 30 grunge t-shirts. I said, this is ridiculous. So I didn't say, which do I like? Because we know I would, I would rationalize. Oh, I like this one's really soft. This one is from a charity walk, I remember this one. I said, how many do I need? I picked a number, 12. 12 grunge t-shirts is enough. So I kept calling until I got to 12. And you giving myself a numeric goal made me keep at it and, ju and just not which is soft, which do I like more. Um, I had a really big wake up call when uh, during COVID when my husband and I took our boxes of photos. He said, what a perfect COVID activity. We had four boxes of albums. He said, let's sort through and we're going to um, pick out the photos we like. And I take out a photo, and there is me with our then eight-year-old, I guess she was seven or eight-year-old daughter. And I look, 
you know, whenever you look at a picture, you look at her young, you look at yourself young. I looked at the t-shirt I was wearing and I said, oh my God, I still have that t-shirt. She's 43. <laughs> you know, I knew it was old. I didn't realize it was almost four decades. But you get to a certain age, you just keep things in your closet. It's very soft now, I, I'm, I promise you. We don't even realize how long we've kept things. And I, I went and I had copies of that um, T-shirt made, and I have a picture of myself that I posted on Facebook, and it's me wearing the 37-year-old T-shirt holding the picture of myself all those 37 years ago wearing the same T-shirt saying, how do I still have this? So the smart self-talk, questions that you could answer in one word, is a good way to get around the rationalization that we do. Um, I also like visual, uh, visual ways of, finding, of going through rationalization. And this is especially effective in closets where we might say, I might wear it sometime. This one, every person here can do when they go home. Now, most of us, when we put things in our closet, we hang them up with the round part facing, facing us. Because it's very easy then. You just take it off the pole. So when you go home today, I want you to put everything in your closets like this. I know you're going to say, but that's inconvenient. Don't worry. The first time you wear this item and go to hang it back up, Hang it the way you like. What do you think you will find out six months from now? Everything with that point still facing out, you do not wear. It's really a visual way. It's a really visual way of proving to yourself, do I ever wear that? And it's very, very easy to do. So you can see why A was like, is one of my favorite letters in SMART. That's the A in SMART, abundance. Now we come to the R in SMART, which is for remembering. And what I'm talking about remembering are the things that we have, not, not the things we've acquired because we purchased them, the things that we have acquired because they came from a family member especially someone who's no longer alive. So I want to tell you the story of my mother's cake plate. My mom passed away when I was 27. My dad had died and I was eight, so I was a young orphan. And I inherited many of my mom's things, especially kitchen-type items. And one of my favorite was a glass cake plate. It wasn't cut glass or etched glass. It wasn't fancy, but she had used it often. So it became my go-to cake plate as well. So one day, I, made a, I went to a party, and I said, oh, I'll bake a cake. So I, I baked the cake. I put it on the cake plate. And there was a lot of cake left over um, at the end of the party. So I said to the hostess, don't worry. I'll get the cake plate another time. And the next day... I get a phone call. Hi, Margaret. Please tell me this cake plate wasn't a family heirloom. I said, well, it belonged to my mom, who's dead, and it's one of my favorite things. Dead silence on the phone. And then I said, but my mom, is in my, my mom is in my heart and my mind, not in a cake plate. Well, what was I going to say? It was pretty clear the cake plate was kaput. But as soon as I said it, I realized it was true. My kids never knew their grandparents. And the cake plate would never mean to them what it meant to me. But I realized something more. My mom came to this country from Hungary, hence the name Margit, uh, when she was 12 years old. And uh, it, because she did not know English, they put her back a year in school. Four or five years later, 
when she was still in high school, she got TB and went to a sanitarium for a year. And when she got out, she was then two years behind everyone in school and she did not finish high school. Now I grew up knowing that I would go to college but I also knew how much it bothered my mom that she did not have an education. Sometimes she would meet the parents of my friends and this person was a lawyer and a school teacher and she would say, I know I didn't go to college but I think I'm just as smart as they are. And she was so smart and so well read. She kept this long list of all the books she had read and we loved to talk about books together. So if I read How Green Is My Valley, she got a copy and read How Green Is My Valley. When I read Le Petit Prince in French, she read it in English. And we love talking literature. When um, I, I went to Penn for college and I assumed I lived in Philadelphia that I was going to live at home. Now no one who lives, I mean, everyone lives on campus, but back then a lot of people commuted. And right before school started, we got a letter saying they would pay for my room and board. I had a, I had a scholarship for tuition, but they were willing to pay for room and board too. And my husband said, I think you should live on campus. And I said, you want me to not live at home? And she said, I didn't raise you to keep you here. This is a wonderful opportunity. When I said my mom is in my heart and my mind, what I realized is that if I want my children to know who their grandmother was, they're not going to learn it from a cake plate. They're going to learn it from stories I tell of my reading books with her of her saying to me, go, go abroad, take advantage of this, do things. That I was safeguarding the wrong thing. And my obligation to my kids wasn't to protect, and to my mother, wasn't to protect her belongings. It was to pass on stories about her. And I had not done a good enough job. Now, I know we all have things that came from other people in our families. And when we go to downsize, they feel like their own kind of special burden because it feels like I can't part with these or what do I do with these? And I can only tell you that for me, I realized that I need to pass on the story, not the belongings. And shortly after that, I was able to look at my mother's set of Rosenthal china, which had been her proud and joy, which you can't put in the microwave because it has a silver, a gold trim. You can't put it in the dishwasher because it's got a floral print that washes off. And I had safeguarded it for decades. I kept it carefully packed in my basement. And I said, that's not honoring my mom keeping something packed in the basement isn't honoring her. And I found a, a thrift store that supported a charity that I knew would resonate, with, whose purpose I knew would resonate with her. And I donated those dishes and felt that's honoring her more than keeping something for decades in the basement. So I, I, I hope that you think about this kind, these kinds of stories when, and these issues of how do you honor someone, how to, one passing on the story and also what truly honors them. Is it the belongings that they, that they purchased or that they had in their house or is it passing on those stories about them? Maybe we need to do more about that. And there is a thing about stories often my husband and I have told stories to our kids, and yes, we have seen them at times roll their eyes like, oh, God, not this again. And, you know, we've said to them, you're not getting it. We're not just telling the story because we think you haven't heard it. We're telling the story because it makes us feel good every time we tell it. Kids think that the story is for them, and, and often it is. But a great story 
brings joy every time you tell it. You think about the memories, the person. So that's another thing to think about when you tell the stories, the satisfaction you get from telling them. So if your kids give you a face like I've heard it before, just tell them, I was at his program. And she said, I can tell this story as many times as I want. It's no, it's not that you don't remember you told it. It's that you feel good every time you tell it. And that is the R in SMART. So that brings us to the T, the last letter, which is for both timing and thriving. One of the books I enjoyed a great deal was uh, Memoirs by Katherine Graham. She was the editor-in-chief of the Washington Post. And she starts one chapter with a sentence something like, um, I think moving is like childbirth. If anyone remembered how hard it was, they would never do it a second time. Does anyone here have two or more children? You did it more than once? You know, childbirth is plenty challenging. It's, it's hard, but it ends and you have something amazing. Moving is challenging, but it also ends. And what you have when you arrive at Goodwin House is a really amazing life where you will thrive. You know, we didn't say to our children, oh honey, don't do it if it's hard. We didn't say things that are hard aren't worth doing. We said lots of things that are worth doing are hard. Moving to a place where you have connection and, 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 and stimulation and new experiences, that's how you thrive. We've all read the articles. Every other day, there's a new article on Next Avenue. Here's the, what you have to do to thrive. You have to have exercise and social connections and good nutrition and stimulation, all the things you have living in community. So yes, I know moving is a challenge. I was a move manager for 25 years. But just because something is hard doesn't mean it's not worth doing. Being where you will thrive is worth doing. And the timing to do that is now. People often say, well, maybe in three years, maybe in five years. It's a wonderful real estate market. And the time to move is when things are really good. People often say, why would I move? Things are great. You don't want to move in the middle of uh, a disaster. My husband and I bought a shore home. Um, it was a dream come true. And he said, uh, where can, I don't want to own two homes. Where can we rent with three dogs? And I said, nowhere. You can't rent, nowhere will we want to live. And he wanted to, to rent close by. So he said, well, let's, we're going to move to a senior living community. Um, now, I knew all the senior living communities. I moved thousands of people into them. I had him go visit them. And he, he said, this is the one where we fit. He picked one out. This is in Philadelphia area where our kids are. And um, we we were both working full time. We were moving under the best of circumstances. So in December, our move is planned for February. And in December, Bill has a planned hip replacement. And then he goes down, we go down the shore to the shore home. And two days later, he has a massive heart attack. And we truly didn't know if he was gonna live. I'm asking myself, am I still gonna move to the community? if Bill passes away. I mean, I was, tr it was really touch and go. Fast forward, he's fine. But we went from moving under the best of circumstances to moving under the worst of circumstances in a literal heartbeat. His surgery was in the end of January. They, they tweaked him um, and made sure all of his, uh, Organs were exactly where they wanted him. He had a fabulous result. But he was in, in the hospital moving into rehab when our, right when we were scheduled to move. And I did want to move because I said to the marketing director, 
I have three dogs, a husband with a walker because of his hip and oxygen because of his heart. How can I bring them home and sell the house? So we needed to move. So here we had great plans, move under the best of circumstances, and it quickly changed the worst. It's, re you know, you can plan all you want, and I'm not saying move now because something awful could happen. I'm saying that it doesn't matter when you plan. Life is unpredictable. But for sure, plan to do it. Don't plan to do it when you need to move because you're then already planning to do it under a time of a lot of stress. Plan to do it when you're both doing well, if you are part of a two-person household. If it's just you, plan to do it when you are doing well, because life certainly can intervene in between. So that is the T part of SMART. It's about timing. Don't wait for something to be perfect. Um, there is no perfect time to move. It is about moving where you will thrive and not being afraid of doing something that is hard because we all said to our kids, it doesn't matter if it's hard. Lots of things that are worth doing are hard, but they're worth doing. Being where you will thrive is worth doing. So that concludes this portion of the program, which is the time when I do a lot of the talking. And I wanted to both open it up to answer any questions or comments you may have. I'm always up for a good story. And there's also great food back there. And when we stop talking, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to be here if anyone wants, has something they'd rather not say out loud that they want to talk about. I'm also happy to listen to that. And don't forget to be picking up your copy of Squint when you leave. So does anyone have any questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. You know, I gave all of my rings to my kids. I, um, I used to wear three-piece suits and pantyhose and stockings every day, and I bought myself jewelry. And then I realized, probably in my 40s, when I was doing Pilates three times a week, and I said, you know, I probably spend on Pilates every year what I used to spend on jewelry. I used to value things. Now I'm valuing being fit and not having back pain. You know, my priorities changed. So when my kids needed rings, I gave them the diamonds from my rings. And I would have given them amphetis. Yes, yes, yes. You were talking about getting rid of items. One thing I'm concerned about, one thing I'm, I'm curious about we have items that have value, financial value. We don't want our daughters to not benefit from that. But everything I hear, no, they don't want the limos. They don't want the... They don't. But I don't, I'm not... One of the things to be aware of is that determining whether something has value has nothing to do with what you paid for it. Nothing. It has only to do with what people are paying for it today. I've had people say, this is a $10,000 sofa. It still doesn't mean anyone will buy it or pay more than several hundred dollars for a used sofa. Maybe they'll pay a thousand. But people are going, well, I'm not going to. Or the other one is, it's too good to donate. That's one of my favorite comments. You know, I, I remember someone at a program and it was a young woman, and she said that she shopped at thrift stores, not because it's in, but she had several kids and her husband was unemployed. And she said, you would be aghast at some of the things that people donate. She said, just because I shop at a thrift store, I still need to have pride. Why would I wear a sweater that is all pilly or a shirt that has underarm stains? Often in our mind, we're imagining some person living on the street that is not who shops at thrift stores. 
They want to have dignity. If you would not wear something because it is not in a condition that you think is appropriate to wear, it's not appropriate to donate. And I've had people say, well, why would I donate king sheets to a thrift store? Like people, people shop at thrift stores because they want to be prudent. And when I say that set of Rosenthal China, service for 16, I said, someone is going to be so thrilled. Not me, not my kids, but they're going to go to someone who will value it. But one of the hardest things for clients is to recognize that what they paid for something does not determine. People will say these oriental carpets have value, not much, because the market for them is so diminished compared to 40 years ago. So um, auction houses will be a good source of information for what things are worth. You can send photos to auction houses and they will let you know if they are interested and, and be able to give you some realistic expectations of what things are going for. China's tough. I've seen incredible sets of China go for $100 or $200 at auction, which means you get you know 40% of that or 60% of that. And people are going, what? That was, consi you know, you thought of that as one of your fine items. <clears throat> yes. Um, we are in the process of uncluttering the house and getting rid of or donating things that we don't need or we don't use anymore. But the hardest thing I find is we have boxes and boxes of photographs and letters from family members, some of whom have already passed away. Okay, I have How a good answer for you. Okay. Okay. I am told all the time by people who, they, they bring up, this is what I have a hard time with. And you said you have boxes and boxes. I remember when I was getting ready to move with Bill, he said, let's go sort. We have four boxes of albums in the basement. Let's go sort them. And I said, no, I'm not doing that. And he said, why not? We, don't, we haven't looked at photo albums in decades. I said, I know. But if we are very effective, we will reduce four boxes to two, maybe to one we might reduce four boxes to one box, a reduction of three boxes. I have 60 other boxes full of junk, of stuff that I definitely don't need in the basement. So my question about those is, those times, types of mementos, I'm not saying don't do them, but they are time consuming, they are emotional, and the, the amount you reduce your stuff by is usually not that much because you might take six boxes and turn it into three boxes. Most of us have enough in our garages and basements. We have, that's where we have 30, 60, and 80 boxes. I have seen Christmas sections in basements that have 50 boxes, and that's just the Christmas. Then I move to the Halloween and the Easter. This is where the volume is, and I say to people, don't get blocked on one, don't take that topic and get blocked. Move to where you can, I'm just being pragmatic. Move to where you will have the biggest bang for your time investment. And it's not with the four boxes, it's with the 60 of the other stuff. So I'm not saying don't do them, but many of us have time constraints when we, and we also wanna feel a sense of accomplishment. You won't feel a lot of accomplishment by reducing your total house contents by two boxes, but you might feel a lot of accomplishment by wiping out 30. So focus, go to low hanging fruit, go to the old towels, the blankets you aren't used, the Afghans, all the other stuff, the pillows that aren't your favorite, get rid of that stuff, get a big sense of accomplishment and then tackle these time consuming emotional things because I don't want them to become an obstacle to getting to all the other things that have the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, benefit space-wise. Yes. I have a hard time with. Um, I mean, I like donating things, but when it's something when it I like donating things, but it, when it's something that is clearly, you know, torn or dirty, you no, know, not 
looking very good. I hate to throw things away to the trash. You know, I don't like throwing something that in the trash. I think oh, maybe someone no, could there do. There are some places that do fiber recycling okay. where they literally, I, I don't know what those places are around here. Okay. That's yes, ma'am. Good t shirts that are still good, and the shelters have been accepting of those. They, they're clean uh, and they're, they're useful, but uh, they're not brand new. We did have one shelter that said they would only take brand new with tags on, and that was well, that's not what I have. Most, so. most thrift stores, their thrift stores are incredibly challenging and what they will accept, as are many auction and consignment stores. You know, there are some very creative ways to deal with favorite things. Um, I had a client that uh, had a collection of her father's ties and neckties. He had like 90 neckties, a whole, several bureau drawers full. And she picked out 15 of her favorite and she contacted uh, and she found this online, someone who used them to make a pillow for her bed. So instead of having a box of neckties in the basement, she now has a pillow on her bed that she sees every day. So she kept just a small sample that represented all of them, but they kept the memory. So there are a lot of really creative ways to take one or two parts of a bigger collection and and keep it something that is relevant to you and, and in your life every day. I love that she did that. Yes. Um, at my husband's funeral, we gave away these ties. And uh, the few that I have left, a friend of mine, a friend of mine is making uh, masks out of men's ties. Masks out of ties. Yes, sir. <clears throat> After your intelligent discussion about smart, Yes. S M A R T. <clears throat> Why the title Squint? Where did that come okay. from? Well, you thank you for asking about Squint. You'll find that out when you in the introduction, <laughs> but that's okay. That's okay. Um, an artistic ploy that artists sometimes use is they will squint, which puts one part, a small part, hyper focused, but makes everything around it out of focus because then they can zero in on one part of their work or they may do what's called a multiple squint which is looking at multiple pieces and again use that visual technique to sort of see a pattern throughout all the pieces and in a way that's what I did as I looked back at my life and told a lot of stories I was focusing on different memories and parts of my life by my own type of of squinting. Thank you. Great question. He wasn't even a plant. I love that. <laughs> yes. Um, I have a question about photographs. Um, I know this person over here was talking about how difficult it is. Um, I've been going through a lot of my old photographs and digitizing them hoping, and then I want to put them on like those little photo sticks or yep. thumb drives yep. or something, and then sending them to all my relatives. Is that something they would be interested in? So, so the question is, will relatives be interested in receiving a digital format of special photographs? I will tell you, my husband and I have selected the ones that we want to have digitized. Like we go to a bar mitzvah, we don't care what the table setting looked like or the centerpiece. It's, it's much more about people. Um, we're not doing it for our kids. What we realized is we had so much fun going through and remembering. And we would say, look at us, look at Bubby, look at, look at our kids. We haven't looked at those photos in decades. And by digitizing them and putting them on our screen on a photo frame, we're bringing them back into our life to enjoy. And by bringing them in your home, 
If you send them to your kids, you don't know what will happen. If you have them on a photo frame at your house and you have grandchildren who come to visit, they will look and say, is that you? They can't believe we ever look different. They can't. And then it starts wonderful conversations. So you can't control what your kids will do with the, with the photos you send them, but bring them back into your life. And there is a good chance when people visit you, since we're having company again, that those photos, not only will they give you joy, they can be the source of wonderful storytelling and wonderful conversations with other members of the family. So that's what we plan to do. We haven't done it yet, but we have them in baggies, sorted by topic. Um, what do you do when, as you were saying, move and downsize when everything's going well, not when you need to? Um, I am in a very big house that's got wonderful storage space. That's, that's, I'm sorry. I, I, yeah, you understand. I mean, in like. That, that's a hard thing. Like you just said, and I'm only, the, I'm only the one there. You said something about, and I wrote it down, linens and towels. I have four linen closets that all I have to do is close the door. I don't see it. Too much storage is a big challenge. I, that's what I'm asking. And Wendy, how do you okay. push yourself? First of all, towels, we recently did a, um, a pet supply drive and it included towels, towels and blankets and comforters. And we got, so we had, we said drop off at our house and people were bringing over garbage bag sized bags of towels that were no longer the super plush and blankets. And we dropped them off at humane societies. They are always, they need to constantly be washing animals and they go through huge quantities of towels. So when drop them off at a humane society, they actually have a big receptacle for them. And if you can add some containers of, of detergent, they really appreciate that too. So you say, and then it doesn't matter if the, if the towel isn't that soft. I mean, the dog's probably pretty happy with it. You may need to lock it. <laughs> but the thing is, most of us do live in two or three rooms. Most of us live in our bedroom. The, the den or where the TV is, we may have a, our office and the kitchen. And that's it. So when you look at a when you look at an apartment and you think, but what about the we all have all these extra rooms that we don't use, or that we have one little thing we do in that room. Most of us spend 95% of our time. If you put crepe paper in front of the doors of many of the rooms in your house, six months from now, you'll find the crepe paper is still there. Um, I also recommend that you work with move managers. Sorting through is so much more fun when you do it with someone. It really is, and you, you're more effective. You know, I, um, how much time do we have, by the way? You have plenty of time. Okay. You can keep talking. <laughs> when COVID started, I said, well, I need to get exercise. I'm not gonna go to the gym, and there's plenty of YouTube videos I can watch. And there are. And there's plenty of YouTube videos that are geared toward people my age. I could not get any traction. I was not doing it. And I decided I met someone I, and she said she was part of a Zoom cohort where there were four screens and together they paid for a personal trainer who customized things. And I went to it and I really liked it. First of all, when you watch a video, everyone's smiling. None of us smiles. We groan, we grunt. When we go like this, our skin hangs down. I mean, everyone looks the same. We're laughing. It provided, for me, I both enjoy it more. It provided accountability that keeps me going to it. 
it provides connection, it's convenient. So you might say, so I'm paying for something that actually I could do for free on YouTube, but I won't do it for free on YouTube. I do it when I have this accountability and connection. And I think using a move manager can be a lot like that. Yes, you can get a book on how to downsize and that may work fine for some people, but for many of us, we need the accountability, we need the connection. And you might say, well, then I have to pay for it. What a good investment. I'm investing in my physical well-being by, go, by using the, uh, the Zoom personal trainer. And you're investing in your own mental, emotional well-being by using a professional that's going to help you accomplish your goals. They will also have a lot of information about local resources for donating things, giving away things, and selling things. So they're going to help and both help you accomplish your goals, and they'll have resources for you. Yes, sir. Thank you. I have a question about papers. Papers that I've written myself while I was in my master's program, papers I've written for work, uh, all kinds of papers, hundreds. And I find it very hard to throw them, to burn them. That, you know, because it is part of my, who I am. It's part of who you are. And so that's really hard. That, so he's finding it hard to look at the papers, things that he is, they represent his professional accomplishments. Um, there are a couple ideas. One, you could scan them pretty, have all of them scanned, and then you have them forever. I did look at papers that I had from college, and what was surprising to me, aside from remembering how, oh my God, he had to get put it in the typewriter, and um, I thought I was a good writer. I, I mean, I love writing. I love the craft of writing, and I thought I was a good writer in college. I looked at the length of some of my sentences. Oh my God. And I didn't have any subheadings, and I just went on and on. But um, I would scan them. Um, I also will tell you that I was a French major in college. I spoke fluent French. I was pursued by the time I was done my undergrad work. I had most of my master's finished. I'm still a French major, even if I got rid of my French books. That doesn't change. I don't need those books to be who I am. Not having them doesn't change that period of my life. So pick some. You know, we talked about picking some to represent the whole. Maybe keep the bricks and mortar of some of those, the hard copy, and scan others so you actually can have all of it and have some things that are physical that you can look back on. Do a, do a compromise. Well, but if your kids, if you have kids and they said this is going to be a big project, you might say, but it's worth doing. And Just someone can help you make that an easier project. There'll be people who will say, I have resources for that. And it can be easier. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I, I donated a lot of my husband's previous archivist. And I think that's a lot of those papers. And they, you know, they, I, and to the, I sent him all over the world, actually, because of his work. So if you know that your previous company that you work for has an, has an archive that, that would be valuable to them because of the new employees need experience reading what somebody else has done, that's another source. Thank you. Just a couple more questions, Margaret. Okay. okay. Do you have a list of move managers? I mean, I wouldn't know. You can go online and you Google move managers and what do you come up with? The other thing is, could a move manager help me donate a piano? They are one of the things that's very difficult to, so, to get rid of. Um, I will, I'm going to answer that. One, is it an upright or a baby grand? Upright. upright. Um, senior move managers or move senior move and specialty move managers um, are an industry that didn't exist 30 years ago. I probably was one of the first in the country and I was part of the group that got together and said, what are we going to call ourselves? 
And we focused on helping people make the transition from a family home to smaller quarters. Um, we actually formed a national association. I was its first president, and now there are thousands of members. And if you go online and you look at your geographic area, you can find resources. I think it's really likely that the Goodwin House already works with a number of local move managers. We do. And they may be able to provide you with contact information for them. So these are proven resources. If you have a baby grand and you want to have fun, Google baby grand bookcase and you will see a beautiful example of upcycling. Beautiful example of upcycling. Move managers are likely to have some ideas about uprights, but it's tough because lots of people are wanting to part with them. But they, they, will, they will have some suggestions for you. Margaret, we do have a couple of move managers who are business partners that work with us at Goodwin House. And so if you'd like to talk to any of us after the presentation, we'd be happy to give you more details about who we work with and a lot of our residents use a move manager when they're planning their move to the communities. The, the ideas, the stories, the wisdom that I have from, that I've shared with you, yes, a lot of these are personal stories, but much of this came from my 25 years as a senior move manager. Um, I'm no longer doing that, I'm in another chapter, but I absolutely recommend working with someone. It just makes the whole experience so much easier. Yes? Is there any Usually, so the question is about getting rid of hobbies. Um, in my experience, there are often other hobbyists that are happy to take the things you want to part with. I mean, I have seen quilters where I go and they have, they have in their retirement community, they have custom designed a wall of a second bedroom to hold all of their quilt samples and all kinds of different hobbies. But okay, if, this your, is... if your home is sort of like Michael's or AC Moore, we, we can talk. This is our last question. Like the Hummel collection, or we have other things, but that's the one I think of that most people would. What do you do with your collection? You can um, take photographs of the bottom, which will tell how old they are, and you'll be able to go online and find out how old they are, how much they're worth. Many of them will be worth $10 and $20. Things are worth money when they are scarce, and there is not a scarcity of Hummels compared to the people that want them. Um, one, I, food here. I also want you to take advantage and talk to people who are here today. One of the wonderful things of living in a community, the people that you are with every day, the people that you have dinner with every day, this is one of the things that creates richness in your life. So start a conversation with someone that you don't know because that's truly what becomes your life when you move to a community. Uh, I want to thank you very, very much. I will be here if there's anyone who wants to, to talk about anything else. Thank you, Margaret. I'm sure that everybody got a lot out of Margaret's presentation today. Uh, I want to, before we break for refreshments, I do want to introduce you to a few more people. I want you to meet the members of the Goodwin House sales team. And so if you all could just stand and wave when I call your name. So Maeve Milligan is one of our sales counselors in the back of the room. Next to her is Darlene Lamer, also a sales counselor. Faith Hall is our sales and marketing coordinator and put together a lot of the details for today's event and did a wonderful job. Terry Gross is a sales counselor. Over here to the other side of the room, we have Meg Tinklepaw, who is a move-in manager. I don't see Mary Jo Cabgen, our move-in coordinator for, oh, she's handing out books, okay. Um, and Daniel Bauman is a sales counselor. And so many of you raised your hand at the beginning of our presentation to say that this is your first visit to Goodwin House Bailey's Crossroads. If you are interested in learning more about this community or our other life plan community, Goodwin House Alexandria, please speak to one of those folks in the back of the room. The best way to get to know us is to visit us with a personal appointment and see more of the community and get your questions answered. And those people back there can help you with that.
I would also like to have our volunteer residents who are here with us today just kind of stand and wave. Margaret suggested that you meet some new people today. These are the people who already live at Goodman House Bailey's Crossroads, and they're going to be hanging around um, during the refreshment time so that you can get to know them, ask them some questions, ask them about the downsizing that they did before they moved to this community. I know Betty Lou has some great downsizing stories um, about her move here. I also want to let you know that this presentation from Margaret is uh, series one of two series. So this is her first presentation. Her second one is going to be held at Goodwin House Alexandria, our other life plan community, on June the 7th. If you have received an invitation for this event, you will also receive an invitation for that one. Um, so with, we hope new stories, same speaker, new stories. Um, so um, we hope you'll have an opportunity to attend that. Um, and um, that's really it. We do have refreshments. You may have enjoyed them already, but please enjoy them again. Take an opportunity to speak to our sales team and also to our resident volunteers. And thank you very, very much for coming today.